what a beautiful way to uh, to step into the summer as well. Just as it starts to get, you know, nice and warm and whatnot. It's June, yeah. you know, it's the middle of the year. I think I think uh, spiritually that's a great place to be as you go into these like warmer these warmer months, which so many people identify with kind of happiness and being settled and having a good time. Well. Um, which doesn't doesn't technically apply to me over here because oh, it's, it's like that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. So so that so in a way that's good. It's like you rendered yourself immune to the beauty of the environment, and uh, and instead you're tuning into the beauty of within, which is 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 the place that we're all striving for, right? Yeah. Yeah, speaking of which, did you do any of your presence process this week? So I, I will confess that I'm actually starting it this weekend because I have a I have a long weekend uh, so I've got a couple of days off and I've had a very busy week so uh, so I know what I'm like if, if I start it when I'm actually effectively on vacation yeah. and then I do four days in a row I'll yeah. have the habit by the time I come back to work you know but starting right. it when right. I'm in the middle of uh, you know crisis what crisis mode sometimes I know myself those things fall by the wayside. Well, it actually even, I think you might remember, it actually says in the initial write-up in the first third of the book, um, don't start it if you are in a really intense or busy time. Like, ideally start it at a time when you can really just be still and be at peace as much as possible. Yeah. You know, and that's a good place to start from. Yeah, and I, I, and, and that, is, that is certainly my intention. Um, at this point, I'm going to say... Welcome to High Degree. I'm Andrew Sumner. Um, I'm here with Evangeline Lilly. And this is um, the episode, let's see, this is episode six of Evangeline Lilly's Library of the Soul. And, uh, and this week's book is, is fascinating. I'm so glad that this ended up being the last book that we're <laughs> talking about in our sequence of five. It's the Workaholics Anonymous Book of Recovery. And it, uh, before before I, I get into your experience with this book, I just want to say whether it was by design or by, you know, sort of uh, the, the beautiful design of the universe, the sequence in which we have read these books has fascinated me because it's ended up being the, the things that after having that pivotal moment with the red tent, which was very extremely well produced, was a beautifully written novel. I've actually found the last two weeks worth of, of reading matter tremendously meaningful to me. And, and the funny thing is, um, last week's book, um, the the, uh, the, uh, the patient the presence process, that would that that really spoke to me in an unexpected way. If you recall, um, when we were chatting last week, I said, "Well, the thing is, th this." This week is this week's book is almost genetically engineered to have no meaning for me yeah. because because yeah. it's just not the kind of person that I am. You know, I'm not a workaholic. You know, yeah. in fact, uh, you know, I, I I could I could introduce you to a bunch of global company CEOs who describe me as feckless, lazy, fundamentally disinterested in the work, <laughs> much more interested in just chatting with people than actually getting stuff done. You know, not motivated by success or act you know climbing uh, you know gaining wealth or fame just motivated okay. by the moment you know and, and they would say that very disdainfully i'm sure and if they were listening to this they'd be just nodding in agreement but when, yeah. when i when i when i read the book i have to say it spoke to me massively and um and it, it was very interesting for me about uh, the way in which it broke down workaholism and, and talked about there were things that I found fascinating, like adrenalizing and work aversion, which we'll get into, both yeah, of yeah. which are, I think are things that I do all the time. You know, so, <laughs> so, so yeah. And, and it was funny after me saying, yeah, I'm not a workaholic. I, I picked yeah. up this note that's by the side of my bed that my daughter, Lucifer, wrote about um, 10 years ago. And, and, and I was thinking about it when I was thinking about this book and thinking about you. And the note says, um, don't work too hard, Dad stay calm and don't die <laughs> and for you, the, the, you you can't see it. there's a mirror behind this monitor for years it was on the mirror now it's on my kind of bedside cabinet which is a, a piece that my dad made in the 1950s and i see it every morning when i wake up and yeah that message is stay calm don't die don't work too hard those are words to live by 
Oh my God. I love it. First of all, I love that your daughter wrote that note yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. When, when she was about 10 years old. No. <laughs> yeah. Right. On. Wow. But I, but I relate to that completely because I, I have to say that I was the exact same. You know, I felt like there is absolutely no way I could be a workaholic because I go through periods of time where I like avoid work actively and long periods of time. And anyone who's followed my acting career knows that every movie I do, I retire immediately afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm just like, oh, that was too much. I never want to do that again. Um, but my sisters, and you know, it's funny, it's your daughter, because I think the people who are closest to us often are the ones who can see us the most clearly and yeah. better than we can see ourselves a lot of the times. And my sisters used to sort of challenge me throughout my life a lot about, I don't know if they would name workaholism, but that was the sort of notion behind it. And I would check myself because I trust my sisters and I love my sisters and I know they know me better than anyone. And every time I would check myself and I'd look for the sort of ticks that I sort of picture when I think of workaholism, like this raging CEO with like clogged arteries who's on the verge of a heart attack and who's just a maniac to everyone he yeah. knows because, of course, it's a he, because, you know, like this, this yeah. idea of stereotype. Yeah, buy, sell, sell, buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. That's some Wall Street asshole, Wolf of yeah. Wall Street type guy. And then... Um, and then I, I took on this job in, two, well, I think I engaged on it in 2018 and actually shot it in 2019. And it was a job that I didn't, I wasn't crazy excited about sort of any part of it, but I knew I had to do it. Something in me was like, I have to play this role because my sense was that inner guide was telling me there's something in this role that you need to get out. Like it just has to come out of you. So you yeah. have to embody this character so that Evangeline can sort of exercise something. Exercise, not exercise. And, um, and I did it and it was a role where I played an addict. So I started doing all this research into addiction and I visited an NA meeting, a Narcotics Anonymous meeting, and I picked up the Alcoholics Anonymous book of recovery. And I started doing this reading and I was astounded by how many things I was reading about that I could relate to, even though I wasn't a narcotics addict or an alcoholic, or at least maybe not. I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm not an alcoholic. That is like, <laughs> that's, still, that's still up to for debate in my mind. And, and it, that sort of comes up as you know, now in the workaholics book of recovery, that it can be a sort of subsequent addiction that comes because of the workaholic yeah. Yeah. and so I started to open to the idea that like maybe there was some kind of addictive nature in me which is something I had never I come from a family of addicts and I was like yeah. how did I miss that gene how am I the only one in the family who didn't get that gene because as it states in the book my addiction was so socially acceptable and was so rewarded and was so lauded as like, I got so many pats on the back. Whereas, you know, other addictions tend to be very overtly destructive and people are very con condemning of them. But I remember when I first picked up the book, I, uh, I read this paragraph and I wanna read it because I just remember it just absolutely being like, uh oh, I think I might be in trouble. Many of us, when we first heard workaholism characterized as a real problem, thought that it was some kind of joke. We had many reasons for our skepticism, founded mostly in larger cultural belief patterns and industry norms that seemingly encouraged or even mandated our own personal habits. It did not feel within our control to improve the conditions, so we disclaimed responsibility. We would not really have chosen this lifestyle for ourselves, would we? Anyway, and this is the one that I was like, uh-oh. We knew people who worked much harder than we did. Some of us had periods when we hardly worked at all or even actively avoided work. So we felt certain that overworking was not an issue at all. Workaholism is not strictly about the amount or type of work we do. Instead, our disease impacts the emotional and spiritual relationship we have to work and activity. Such distortion can negatively impact us as well as those around us, often without our knowing it. Our health, happiness, and relationships suffer. Don't die, Dad. 
<laughs> workaholism involves both a substance addiction to adrenaline and other stress hormones and a process addiction, compulsive doing or not doing. And its reach extends far beyond our paid work life. And this was where I was like, oh, I'm really in trouble now. We have found that we have also exhibited workaholic tendencies when engaging in everything from household chores and exercise regimes to various hobbies that serve as volunteer activities and codependent attempts at saving the world. <laughs> <laughs> Most of these endeavors seem admirable at first, but as we lost ourselves in incessant doing, we fell prey to the compulsivity of addiction. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I, I, I get that, that also completely speaks to me mm -hmm. and uh, it really opened my eyes about about uh, you know what what work, well, their definition of workaholism is so kind of spectacularly wide and inclusive that because mm -hmm. it's really about um uh, yeah, process addiction is such a brilliant thing to uh, identify and discuss uh, and that anybody with that kind of addictive nature that it, uh, as as you've absolutely touched upon addiction doesn't have to evince itself as as alcoholism or substance abuse it can it's in so many ways it's and it's about compulsion rearing its head in so many different ways it, it's funny I, I i'm not an alcoholic but i like a drink but if ever i've got into trouble with alcohol it's come out of an addictive space but not the one that's classically associated with alcohol yeah. so uh, i'm so as you know, one of the things I do is, is I, I edit some books. I particularly sort of edit noir fiction, which is one of the, my, my great interests. And um, I'm, I'm the editor on a series of books, the classic PI character, Mike Hammer, brilliantly written by a guy called Max Allen Collins, who took over from Mickey Splane, who passed away about a decade ago. And he was Mickey's um, protege and he's taken over from, he wrote, he wrote the book, uh, The Road to Perdition, that the movie oh, yeah. The Road to Position is yeah. based on. Super talented guy. I'm his editor on, 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 on these books. And um, I was I was in the middle of editing the last one during last summer. And he gave a very detailed description of, of how Hammer um, loves, uh, his favourite drink is rye whiskey and ginger ale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, my mum drank the occasional whiskey and ginger when I was a kid. And I always thought it was horrible. I thought, well, I love whiskey, but why, why, why on earth would you put ginger ale in it? No, I don't think so. That's not for me. <laughs> but because it's Hammer's drink and I was editing the book and I wanted to kind of get into the Hammer mindset, I thought, right, I'm going to make myself a, a, I'll go to the pub and get a, a whiskey and ginger. And it was horrible. And then I started researching why. And it was horrible because it's made with contemporary ginger ale, made with sweeteners, not classic ginger ale. It wasn't rye whiskey, you know. So I got some, bought some very expensive rye and I bought some very expensive ginger ale. And I made the perfect rye whiskey and ginger ale that tasted like hammer must taste it in the books. And it was fucking delicious, right? <laughs> and it's the middle of summer and I'm, it's, I've got a tall one. And, uh -oh. as, and as a result of that, I thought, fuck me, I've made the perfect, this is the perfect <laughs> drink. I used to drink gin and tonics during the summer. And I was like saying to my son, son, check this out. What do you think of this? And he's like, dad, that's fucking delicious. And I'm like, right, it is, right? It's fucking my camera rye whiskey and ginger. Anyway, cut to two or three weeks later, and I was drinking approximately one bottle of rye whiskey every two days. Uh -oh. <laughs> and, and, and I'm starting to feel fucking awful. You know, I wake up in the morning, oh man, I don't feel so good. Not with the hangover per se, but I just didn't feel so clever. And I realized that my compulsion to get this drink right and inhabit the role of this character whose adventures I was editing had backed me into almost having a massive rye whiskey problem. So I just cold turkeyed it then and then I thought, Christ, I better stop, you know, because I'm going to, you know, be become an alcoholic by accident. Yeah. Well, that, that's really interesting because that's very much the experience that I think a lot, if not most actors deal with when embodying characters. Like, you know, I think it's very, um, it's worth looking at that so often um, characters who embody, I mean, actors who embody really dark dangerous, troubled characters can end up with severe mental instabilities, severe addiction issues, and sometimes even suicide. Yeah. And I think it's what you just described. And I think that there is this incredible compulsion towards, like if you are the type of person who is 
very over-focused or very disciplined or very um, sort of creatively dedicated. I, I think it's a, it's a genuine danger for most of us not to slip into spaces of compulsion. And yeah. for me personally, underneath that compulsion, what I ended up discovering through my journey, my 12-step my journey, um, which was, which took me again, you know, the, I told you the presence process took me like a year every time. I never, yeah. never did it in the 10 weeks allotted. Um, the, the 12 step process also took me about a year, a year and a half. It was a, it was a long process for me. And partly that's because step four and five just were such a, a deep investigation into what it is I was running from. Um, but, but what I discovered under my compulsion, which was much more dangerous and much more insidious and much more deeply entrenched in me than compulsion itself was perfectionism. And, um, there's, a there's a, a line in the, the part about work aversion, which we should probably maybe touch a little bit on, you know, yeah. what, what these things are, but the work aversion, you know, it says, um, it has been said that we would rather perfectly avoid life than imperfectly live it. Yeah. And that one has, that is me. I, I'll go, I'll go full tilt at life and I'll put everything I've got into it. And, and I, and I expect and need a perfect outcome. And when that doesn't happen, then my kind of cowgirl attitude of like, fuck this shit comes in and I just, I'm out. Yeah. Yeah, you know, forget it, and and it's and I've realized it's not just about the outward outward world. It actually is much more prevalent with myself. Like if I feel that I have failed or I have let myself down or I have let somebody else down, I'm much more inclined to cave out and disappear and just become a ghost because I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want to make mistakes. Um, and if I and if I do, then I become afraid of existing because I know by virtue of my very existence, I'm going to do those things. I'm going to hurt people and I'm going to make mistakes. And so then I've retreated. And then once I've like licked my wounds for long enough and sort of bolstered back up my spirit and sat in the reverie of being with what is my source of, of love which, you know, is, is God or, you know, source. Um, then I go, okay, I'm ready. And I sort of put my armor back on and charge back out into the world. Um, but with the same goddamn expectation that it's all going to have work out perfectly again. Yeah. Not, not up here, deep in here, you know, up here, yeah. I'm smart enough to be like, of course, nothing's perfect. Nothing's ever going to turn yeah. out perfect. But deep in here, something else is going, oh, you watch. I will make I will do it <laughs> this time. This time is my time. I will get it right. Now that's fascinating to me because do you think that um, that um, a, an element of your career choice, being an actor, is the fact that by definition, what happens is if you have a tendency to to walk away at, at certain moments, the the thing about being an actor is. The ability to do that is encoded in the process because you come together with a creative group of people for a defined period of time that always ends. Even if it's on a long running TV show and it's six seasons of Lost, it always ends. And then it's a complete reset. And I'm always struck by, you know, the actors I've met over the years, how many of them have had this incredible experience with co-workers, deep relationships with people for a period of time and have never seen them again. Mm. Yeah. And and it's so incredibly common. And of course, you do get active friendships that last a lifetime. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's one of your so co-workers, fun. Michael Douglas and Danny DeVito, for example, been mates forever. But you hear so many experiences. Of, oh, yeah, I really loved X, Y, or Z. And we had a brilliant relationship. We were very close. But actually, the day we stopped shooting, I've never seen them since. Yeah, it's 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 a it's an accurate observation. Um, but I was so. I was so in, in, in intense about my retreat and I did it so much and so well that for me becoming an actor became this I mean, soul wrenchingly painful. Um, I had this ne necessity that I had to stay 
So like when I, my first job, my first speaking role in film and television was my role as Kate Austin on Lost. Yeah. And I remember feeling like, oh, this is my fucking refiner's fire. Like I am being put through it by having to stay on this island with these people for six years. Like for me, that was the, the longest I had stayed anywhere as an adult up to that point in my life was six months. That was the longest. And my relationships, I had one friendship from you know, high school, college, young adult. I had one friendship. I, everyone else, it was exactly what you just described of actors, which is you know, work at a restaurant for a while, super friendly with people at work, hang out with them after work, but in the workplace and never see them again, you know, just never engage in that way. And it was, it was a huge challenge for me doing Lost and being stuck on an island literally with the same, you know, 15 people. And like, I didn't really branch out that much on the, on the islands. I didn't have a lot of friendships outside of set. I mean, you work crazy hours, you're there all the time. And also it was my first parlay into fame. And so I had this discomfort with sort of not knowing when anyone was genuinely my friend yeah. or when people were just enamored by the idea of <clears throat> yeah, friends with cool. people. So uh, navigating all that created this, this isolation that really was only relieved by the cast and crew on set. Um, and so I've actually, I mean, I've, I, it's, I think what you've observed is correct, but I think for me, it was the opposite. It forced me into staying, it forced me into being still, it forced me into a space where I couldn't, I, after the first uh, season of Lost, I desperately wanted to quit. I really wanted to quit. I wanted to get out of Dodge. I was done. I couldn't stay. Um, and so as, as is always the case, you know, art was imitating life and life was imitating art because I played a character who was on literally on the run and yeah. was suddenly stuck on an island and suddenly had to stay still with the same people and face her shit, um, which is, you know, what was happening. But I was 24. So, you know, there's a I think there's a there was for me a limit as to how much I could really face my shit and like where, how deep I could really go with that. Yeah. But it was, it was a trial. And, and, and you at the, you know, the center of a tornado center of a hurricane, because it, it what lost a social phenomenon. Yeah. So I, I, I it, it makes me think of um, two actors. I I'm, I'm guessing you've probably not been likened to in the past and, and that's Laurel and Hardy. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and Laurel and Hardy, um, I remember they were so focused because the world was different when they were at the peak of their fame. Yeah. You know, it's much more difficult to travel across the world. It, communication wasn't instantaneous. But you're talking about two people who are probably the two most recognisable people in the world in the 1930s. Yeah. And um, made millions, billions of people laugh around the world, you know, around the entire world. But they were just there in Southern California, working on the movies, playing their golf, smoking the cigars or whatever. And um, I remember reading that when the when their movie career effectively came to an end and they started doing things like musical tours in the UK, which they made a film about a couple of years ago, stuff like that in, in their later age, they were just completely staggered by how much they were universally loved and how famous they were. And being in that bubble, it was was it kind of they were hermetically sealed almost against that and they, they well they knew they were successful the emotional um effect of that success you know wasn't wasn't accessible to them until they later started traveling and it, it and that made me think of your experience with lost were in a different era where you're in the communication age so you can feel the effects of it you're caught in the eye of this in the eye of this pop culture hurricane that's that's really a cause celeb in a way that few tv shows in the in the preceding 20 years had actually been you know so it, it, i mean of course it's happened before there have been other tv shows that blown up like that but I, I guess i'm thinking the last time it happened before loss was probably with season one of twin peaks when that went ballistic it was some it was genuinely different like lost was genuinely different and you know i think being in the middle of that with with your friends and colleagues must have been such an unusual time i, I, I must have been such a such an um, unusual thing to have to deal with and carry around it certainly was for me 
I can't speak to everyone else. I always felt unconsciously, no, consciously, like I was having a different experience than everyone else on the show. Um, and I think that was um, my perception was that, you know, uh, because I had um, come into the situation uh, sort of happenstance, like it, it wasn't by design, it wasn't me spending years pounding the pavement and trying to become a famous actress. It was me working um, to pay my university bills and my car insurance and, and, and still manage to go to school, which requires, you know, a really flexible job. And that's what extra work and stand-in work and commercial work and acting work was, was like, I could make a lot of money in a short period of time. And then I could focus on my studies for a long period of time. And, and it sort of balanced out really well. And I'd managed that balance for a while. Um, but really my focus was on what I was doing in uni. So like to, to just suddenly be in this place, I felt like for everyone, I, I would look around me and think uh, it felt to me like my co-stars were, were really on the top of the world. Yeah. This is what they worked so hard for, and this is what they wanted for so long. So and they I, were they were feeling the rock and roll moment of it. I think so yeah, that's that was my impression, and yeah. that I they were feeling the rock and roll moment, and I was feeling rocked and rolled, and <laughs> really uncertain of like how I ended up here and what was going on, and if I even wanted that. Even you wanted it, yeah. Um, and just trying to catch up with, is this. What, like, is this what I want? And is this where I want to be? And is this, and and how do you acclimatize to that if you, you are not, you're not sure if you want to? Yeah. I think it would be a much faster um, adjustment if I had gone into it just hoping and wishing and praying that one day something I did as an actress would hit and make me famous. Yeah. But I had spent my time on set with my nose in my books, watching actors on set thinking, those poor people, they have the worst job. And then going back, going back to my <laughs> own work. <laughs> and the reason I thought it was the so shitty was I would watch how all of the, I was an extra a lot. And I would watch how everyone on set responded to them and how the whole environment of the set would shift and change when they stepped onto the set. And I just think, ugh, what a horrible way to live where like we're all normal and doing our thing. And then you walk in and just, like the environment changes yeah. and that and everyone's sort of walking on pins and needles and like trying to you know I, I don't know I and so then to be that person when that wasn't yeah it was it was a it was a rocker but similar to the Laurel and Hardy situation um what has happened for me over the uh, over 10 years since the show ended um is that I've had, like, at the time I knew it was having an impact on people. Yeah. But I have since had people come to the show and watch it for the first time and reach out through social media and tell me how it was impacting them. And I've had people reach out to me saying they've watched it for the sixth time and how it moved them for the sixth time. And the longer this goes on for the more I start to actually believe the hype. Whereas I used to be so skeptical of it. I used to think, oh, come on, it's a TV show. We're not curing cancer. I'm not doing something miraculous. Like what we're doing is, a, it's a TV show. It's pop culture, it's money-making. It's like, it's not important. You know, it didn't feel important to me. And, I, and I'm now being convinced over, you know, 15 16, 17 years of response from people, a heartfelt response from people that um, it was all worth it, you know? Yeah. And, and that it really did actually have a really profoundly positive impact on the world at large. And, and even if that's just on an individual level, that's something, and that's something to be proud of. And that's something that I'm grateful for because otherwise it would have, I think, felt like something I might've regretted at some yeah. point, you know? I mean, I, I think there's uh, that, that there's no doubt that that is true. That it, it, I mean, I think I can understand how you're in something long running and you think, oh man, you know, it's kind of this middle of the road piece of entertainment, and I was on it. I was on the love boat for so long. Maybe I should have only done two seasons or whatever. I'm not trashing the love boat because I'm related to people who love that show, right? But 
um, I think the thing about Lost is is undoubtedly a superior piece of work. And and whatever you think about how it began, how, how the middle of the show was, how it ended, one thing's undeniably true about it. It's as an experience, it's um it's very powerful and hypnotic. And that's how I found it. I was I was a big fan when the show was on, and it was it was destination TV for me. I don't feel that way about many TV shows, but I had to watch Lost in real time. Not you know I had to watch it week by week, and yeah. and and I frequently had this experience that I've only ever had with a handful of TV shows where the end titles would rather be like, oh, God, the episode's finished. I'm like, roll the next one. Now I was desperate to see. <laughs> uh, and and, and, that, would go, and that would go on week after week after week. It's like, oh, holy fuck. You know if you feel cheated when a show's ended that it's exerting an unusual power over you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and back then you couldn't just binge it. You couldn't go That's to the right. next one. And yeah. I actually... I miss that experience. Yeah. I just binged the morning show with Jennifer Aniston oh, and, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and Reese Witherspoon the other day. And I was, I, I binged it because it was like that kind of TV where you just want to keep going. And I just, I was, I really enjoyed the show, but I found myself afterwards realizing, God, there's such value in watching something and then being forced to give it time to settle inside of you and to ruminate in your heart and your mind and for questions to pop up and thoughts and, you know, the whole lost, you know, um, sort of mythology of the water cooler talk the next morning on Thursday morning, everybody at work talking about what happened and what their theories are. And there isn't room for that when you binge, you get all the answers immediately. That's right. And then when the show ended and there was such division over how it ended, you know, my response always was that I really loved how it ended because it it forced you back to the water cooler for one last time instead of wrapping it up with a pretty bow like it would if it was a religion. It would say, so now here's your answer. Yeah. I would spoon feed you information and say, this is how this is. These are the answers to the great questions we asked in this show, which are the great questions of the universe. Instead, it, it said, go back to the water cooler and figure it out. Yeah. You know, that's our, our calling in life, right, is to, to be in community and together come to our conclusions instead of being spoon fed. That's the joy of living. And I love that about the show. And, and that, that thing of taking pause to, to allow things to integrate into who you are is what I think we have dramatically and detrimentally lost in the last 10 years of the advent of social media and the World Wide Web going worldwide and being readily available to everybody in the world. Well, most, a lot of people in the world. And, and, and even me, who is somebody who is extremely reluctant to participate in that, um, once I did, once I started to, the way it shifted my internal psyche was profound. And I really, uh, I credit that as being one of the reasons why I slipped into workaholism. For me, workaholism was is a relatively new thing in my life. I can track back and say, yeah, it started around here. And I can sort of point to the moment in time where I recognize that a shift happened in me, where I went from very much living my truth in my moments to suddenly living in this, in this compulsive way. And I really believe that social media and spending a lot of time on it was contributing to that because instead of like how it used to be, watching an episode of something, reading a book, you know, having a conversation and then being forced to just sit with that and allow it space to sort of settle, having a success in my career, having an incredible moment with my child and then being forced to just sort of internalize that and allow that to integrate into who I am and my understanding of the world. Now, all of those things become commoditized and all of those things become something that is immediately handed over to everybody else. So I receive a blessing, I receive a trial, I receive an experience and then I just pass it off like a baton in a relay race. And it's, and it's passed into the ethers and it's gone. And it's no longer just mine. And it's no longer sinking in because I've presented it out. And I and that's something that the 12-step recovery program for workaholism really, really challenged me on and has really, it's still hard for yeah. me to this day. And I, I'm constantly in recovery. So I mean it's very fresh for me. I would say I, I finished, even though you're never really finished. 
about six months ago. And, um, you know, yesterday was a beautiful day where I fully got caught in the whirlwind of compulsion. And I, and I knew it and I saw myself doing it. And that's one of the advantages of like recognizing what's going wrong is you can see yourself doing it. And now I can, I can see when I'm doing it. Um, but it's so tempting because there's so much available to ingest online and there's so much access to connection yeah. online. You just want to keep doing this all day, every day. Because gratification is instant. Uh, and one of the things that we've lost is the journey uh, to to acquire information uh, and we've touched upon this in some previous episodes but previously it would take you'd be interested in something it might take you 20 years to complete that knowledge i remember th think there's a number of things about which i'm passionate jazz music being one of them when i first started trying to dis you know, find things out about jazz music living in the northwest of england in the 70s where rock music was everything and you know mm -hmm. the beatles has left a strong imprint trying to find people who could give me more information outside just going oh i like this one tune you know the quest for information in fact, took me years and years of my life yeah. but but now of course we, you have the entire world library at your fingertips and instant gratification is where it's at and so and so the, the thing is if you've got any tendency towards compulsion things can grab you in real time and you can have an entire library's worth of information what continually one click away so you become fascinated i find you, you can become fascinated and sated by something in one extensive period of time but it might be say two days of your life this is what happens to me that i find out about something like, holy fuck that's fascinating i've got to know more about this bang 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 bang, bang. i i have that experience a lot when i listen to podcasts by Ma malcolm gladwell we talked about a particular subject and i've become so interested in it and then i start pulling the tape through and trying to find out everything about it and three days later three days of my life is gone and i'm a whole weekend of my life where i could have been out in the sunshine or whatever it's just been obliterated trying to learn everything about this topic well, and what the real tragedy of that in my mind is, as somebody who is, is thirsty for knowledge, is that what you learned in those three days will inevitably be lost. Yes, exactly. Because you yeah. cannot hold on to that much information over right. that short period of time. But what you learned in your years of searching for jazz information is locked in. Yeah. That knowledge now, that isn't wasted time, that isn't gone. But what we end up doing is what's so sad. If, if you could do that three day binge online, which we've all done and, and, you know, is so exciting and really gives you that adrenalized rush that, you know, is so satisfying for somebody um, who, who struggles with this stuff. Um, if you could, if, in my mind, if you could retain all that information and then carry it through into your life, it's worth it. You know, it's worth it. Don't do it every weekend, but sometimes fantastic. Do that yeah. twice a month, you know, if you can, but we can't. And maybe we will adapt to that. And maybe younger generations are adapting to that. I really do think that younger people are like either by conditioning or biologically just able to retain information, facts, you know, tidbits, trivia, much more readily than we can. And I think it's from exposure. And I think it's Oops. from growing up with all of that being thrown at them all the time. So maybe that will be an adaptation. Maybe we're moving towards that, but we're not there yet. And right now, I think it's like suddenly adults have been turned into the infants in a weird way. Yeah, and yeah, for sure. Way where we don't have the wisdom and discernment to understand how to navigate this digital age. And, and in some ways are looking to 17 year olds and 22 year olds to sort of be the guy. And you're like, how do we do this? <laughs> what do I do? I, I heard this podcast. I was absolutely fascinated. I needed to know more. I went online and suddenly a week of my life was gone. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> yeah. And they're like, Oh mom, you know, like, yeah. what? Oh, let me help you, you know? <laughs> No, it, 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 it's so true. Hearing you talk about this, I, I realise that I haven't asked you one of the core questions that we usually get into when we're discussing these books we've experienced, um, which is how did you first encounter Workholics Anonymous Book of Recovery? What brought you to it? Well, we touched on it a little bit, but I can expound um, because I talked about how there was that movie that I did where I played an addict. Yes, yeah. But I really think it started long before that. And um, 
conveniently for this podcast, but truthfully to my life, um, I think what happened was about five years prior, I started the presence process. And in starting the presence process, my belief is that what I started doing was inviting whatever was in me that was not integrated, that needed to be integrated, that needed attention, that needed for me to look at it and give it space and time and, and make it a part of myself. Um, so I, I was in doing the presence process. I was asking for those things to be revealed to me, to be, to surface, to come to the fore so I could address them. And, and, and that was, that was a long journey of small pieces, small pieces, small pieces, small pieces. They were all leading me, you know, peeling the core of the onion, the, the layers of the onion into some, some root issues that were at the heart of me that I was not looking at, was not aware of. And so I really believe that when that inner guide, when that still small voice was telling me, you need to do this role. And I was going, well, why? Like, you know, why this one? Of all the movies in the world that I could choose to do, why this one? Um, the only answer I got back was, and it sounds dark and scary, and it kind of was, there is darkness in you that needs to come out. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I really believe that because I was entrenched in doing the presence process, and at that point, I think I, it was the fourth time I'd done it, um, that it ultimately was that practice that led me down this dark road of, of playing this addict and um, also having my health simultaneously um, collapse. So I had an, an immune and nervous system and neurological collapse. And I was bedridden for most of that year. And I actually pulled out of that movie saying I'm not well enough to do it. I'm not physically well enough to do it. And then was convinced to do it anyway. Um, sometimes I look back on that and I, you know, the, the logical part of my brain goes, you should have never done that movie. Like never, you, you know, I ended up in the hospital in that movie. Yeah. And um, the other part of my knowing brain, my knowing self, my deeper self, just chuckles and goes, but you got exactly what you needed out of that movie, which is you needed to, to look at your addiction. You needed to look at yourself and recognize that you're an addict. And it was on that movie. So I, was, I, was, I got there. I was in Montreal. It was very, very cold. Um, and I, I, I was having a relapse of what had, I mean, essentially had never really gone away of, of medical issues. And, um, and, and I was basically in a position where I had to do the film at this point. Otherwise I'd be in risk of being sued for everything. Yeah. I found. And, um, and I, and I broke down and the question that was just plaguing me was how did I get here? Why did I do this? Why did I commit? And why did I come when I knew I was weak and I was fragile and I was unwell and, and facing that question. And also why am I alone? Like nobody was there. I was alone in this hotel room in a cold, strange place, you know, where I had no friends and no family. And I was going, to, I had a, an assistant who I met that day yeah. who had, help me into my underwear and help me into the bathtub and help me to the hospital. Like it was so, I mean, I just kept asking like, how did I allow this to where, how did I get here? Yeah. And, um, and then, and then that I finally for the first time said, maybe I have a problem and maybe that problem is connected to my work. And then I went online and looked up workaholics anonymous and read just a little write-up. And it was like everything in that write-up described me. And then there's this quiz, this like 20 question quiz. Yeah, the 20 says, questions, right? yeah. Yeah, the assess if you're a workaholic. And it says if you get, I think it said if you get like two or three or a yes, you're probably a workaholic. You might be a workaholic. That's right, if, 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 yeah, if you have, it's it's a really low, low number. It's if you really get three number. of these, you know, yeah. Yeah, then you're, you not for sure, but likely. I had 19 and a half out of 20. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I was like, oh shit, I, I have a problem. I have a problem. Yeah. Like an actual, this is not, this is not like, you know, my usual bootstrap attitude was like, just overcome whatever you're struggling with and just be stronger and get up and go again. And like, rah. 
And this was like, no, 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 you, you need to stop and you need to look at this. And um, so I ordered the book that night and um, it didn't arrive until after I'd finished the, the film. But um, what's kind of amazing and beautiful and crazy about that story is I literally like closed the pages on the presence process for the fourth time the day before I had that meltdown where I was, I mean, I really, I was a mess. And I, and I think it was a gift. I think I needed to get sick. I think I needed to be broken. I think that I was so stubborn and strong and proud and capable and all these other things that unless I was brought to my knees, I wasn't willing to really look at things. And I remember my partner even saying to me when I called him um, to tell him what was going on. And um, he said, come home. And I said, I can't. And he said, um, well, maybe, maybe this is what you need. Maybe you need to end up in the hospital on your deathbed before you're gonna sit up and recognize what's going on with you. And I was like, holy shit, cause he just never, he's not that guy. You know, he's not, I am that person. I'm the person who's gonna give you your hard truth. He's not, he's the person who's just gonna quietly support you and let you do what you're gonna do. So um, yeah, that was that was how I came to it, and and what was interesting was that that element of but I'm not like I don't work eighty hour work weeks every week. I'm not that person. I'm a really like chilled out person in so many ways. I just I love. Remember I told you I think it was last week that I was greedy. I'm greedy for the experience of life, yeah. like in all ways. Um, and. And I realized that I was, there's, there's the workaholic who's that stereotype and that exists and that's real that we talked about. Then there's the work averse workaholic who is yes. somebody who yep. really, really struggles to work at all. Yep. And then there's the middle ground, which is where I lay, which is what they call adrenal cycling, yep. where you cycle between intensive periods of work that are extremely unhealthy and over the top. And then you crash into work aversion where you just hide away and do nothing. And then you just keep going back and forth. And this keeps your sort of hormonal chemical addiction to these stress hormones on a constant roller coaster. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, and that, that's, that's interesting to me because unlike unlike many of the experience that we've discussed during the course of working our way through these books, actually, this is the one where what you've just, just described also describes me, a very different person from you, and that is exactly what I do, all mm. or nothing. So I will gold brick for days and then work around the clock and not be able to stop. You know, I'll have a man edit a manuscript to edit, and I'll just be off. I just, you know, I'm the classic case of the writer editor who doesn't want to write or edit. I want to do anything else apart from those two things. But once I start, until you're doing it. what's that? Until you're doing it. Until I'm doing it, and then I can't stop, and then yeah. I can't sleep, I can't eat, I work all yeah. night. It's great. It's ridiculous, and I just can't pull myself away from it. Um, I, I, and uh, and. You know, I can't make myself take a break. I can't put my brain on a different track. It's exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's so interesting. It is. It is interesting, and I think it's it's really relevant. I mean, I I can't tell you how many times I was reading this book, and I just thought, this isn't a me problem. This is an us problem. This is our culture. This is our society. Well, this yeah. is what we have created for everybody. And anybody who's living outside of this space is heroic in this point in time because most of us have become victims of this capitalistic, consumeristic machine that makes us become no more than the sum of our products. And I think that that is the way we have approached business and that is the way we have now approached ourselves. And as a result, it's also uh, in a lot of ways, the way we approach faith and religion is that it is only the sum of its product. Yeah. And if there is no immediate, visible, recognizable achievement or product that is produced, then it's worthless. Yeah. And, I, and absolutely, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, the, it's the byproduct of the, of the results culture 
in which we yeah. live. So, uh, and it, it holds true on so many levels in work, in, in, in classic office space work for corporations, working for corporations. Capitalism itself is about winning and losing. Yeah. Sports, which many people use to relax, are about winning and losing. Yeah. Uh, and competition, whether it's against your, your, your comrades or just against yourself, this results based culture in which you live, uh, I, I think it, it's, it's kind of the, it's almost like the enemy of internal peace. You know, it's constantly competing on some level, I think is, is, there's a lot of joy to it. A lot of people extract a lot of joy out of it. But yeah. you, know, you, you hold yourself to that constant competition. It means on one level you can never rest. Yeah. And I think that I think that the competition isn't the problem. I think the problem is our perspective on the competition, yeah. which has become that only winning has value. And that didn't that wasn't historically what we were being taught in, by all of our wise elders. You know, that was not what you would teach your children. And I think what, you know, when I raise my kids, one of the things that I want for them is I want them to have opportunities to lose yeah. so that I can have the opportunity to teach them where losing fits in their life and how good it is and how valuable it is and how meaningful it is. And I think when we shelter ourselves from competition and we say, well, a competition is the evil, now we lose the opportunity for what we really, really need, which is acceptance of everything, of all of it. I was listening to, um, are you familiar with Jordan B. Peterson? I am, yes, yeah. Oh my God, what a mind. I was listening to him and Russell Brand um, go at it for two hours on his um, Under the Skin podcast yesterday. Did you, you saw my post. And I was just invigorated. I love listening to intelligent debate. I love it. And Russell B. Peterson said, like for, he was able to sort of condense his ethos down to one sentence now, which is the same sentence that I have been brought to through this journey that I've gone on in my spiritual walk that we just sort of went on in just little touch points together, obviously yeah. not every book, not every moment, but um, which is, speak your truth and accept whatever happens. And I, I've come to realize that I will never be able to manufacture the results that I want, ever. I won't, it will not, I, I have a fantastic life. I am, I am successful, I am wealthy, I am loved. I, am, I, am so, I have so much blessing in my life but I was able to look at myself through the, the lens of, of this book that really helped me take a good look at myself and recognize somehow I was still never satisfied. And it was, it was really an issue of, of moving away from my authentic self to try to manufacture results. And that really you can't control the results anyway. What's going to happen is going to happen. And if what happens is the result of my inauthenticity, whether it's good or bad, it's going to feel shitty. But if what happens is the result of my authenticity, if it's good or bad, it's going to be okay. I can accept that. I can go, well, at least I spoke my truth. At least I was being me. And at least I have some satisfaction and some sense of myself and some sense of grounding in the world instead of feeling completely lost now because I gave up the only thing that is sure which is me you know, who I am yeah I I hear I, I feel that uh upon that um statement that is the perfect place to close out Holy shit, are we already there? I can't yeah, believe. yeah, I know, we're already there. We're, we I we I are already it. there. Oh. Yeah, I know, I know. It's been honestly, mate, it's been another one of those episodes where I looked at the clock. I, I literally looked at the clock about a minute ago and I was like, wow, it's that's we've done an hour already. Yeah, but you've I think I think you reached a, a very interesting point to close on. And um, uh, that felt to me like a, a very uh, honest and open summation of where you are in mm. relation to the topic of this episode. Yeah. And, um, and in this episode, which is episode six of Evangelina Lee's, not Evangelina, Evangelina Lee's Library of the Soul, uh, which the book in question was Workaholics Anonymous Book of Recovery. 
uh, we've now reached the end of our journey of, of five books in five weeks. And um, we'll be back next week with a concluding episode where we take an overview of everything we've been talking about along this path. Um, in the meantime, everybody's listening into this. Uh, please let us know, you know, what you think. If you've got any questions, if you've got any viewpoints you'd like to share with us. And uh, great, I'll see you next week, mate. I can't wait. Looking forward to it. Take care. Okay, bye. You've been listening to Hard Agree. This episode was edited by John Horsley and Kenrick Regan. And our theme music, Golden, was written and performed for this show by Liverpool's finest band, Denio. Hard Agree is a production of the Spoilerverse and myself, Andrew Sumner. <laughs>